I'm back. Well, where have I been? Well, here's a clue. Yeah, I went to the uh, the Marshall Amplifier Factory in Milton Keynes, here in the UK. Well, first of all, what I really want to do is to say thanks to Fair Deal Music for actually telling me that this open day was on. Otherwise, I would have never even known. And take note of that, Marshall, won't you? Uh, I wouldn't have even known. I've been following Marshall Amps since about 1970. Now, I did make a video a number of years ago. In fact, I made a video about a Marshall tour, believe it or not, 11 years ago. Yes, 11 years ago. And it's down there in the text. And Phil Wells, who was a... An employee of 40 odd years took me round the factory and showed me everything. Well, is it the same this time here in 2023? Well, what I think, I think it's more a reflection of now and then. Go back and watch that video of Phil Wells as he takes me around the factory. It was just an amazing experience. And that's not to say it wasn't an amazing experience this time. In fact, uh, towards the end of the uh, the run around the factory, I got to meet uh, Cherry Marshall and uh, had a quick chat, 10 minute chat with him, which is on a separate video. And that's also down below. So you can go and get the, uh, the griff on that and see what Terry thinks about Marshall in 2023 and where the company's going and things like that. There are a few funny things <laughs> that, I, that I found uh, with various employees as we went round and uh, I got towards one particular point and I'm, I'm chatting away and I sort of said, uh, oh, you know, I took a look at a, a Friedman amp some while back and it was terrible. And the first comment out of the mouth was, don't use the F word here. We hate them. <laughs> and I, that's understandable. But I do think, uh, just before we move on, I think what you should really do is consider whether you want this sort of stuff for the future. Get rid of that. Or whether you want this sort of stuff for the future, or indeed that sort of stuff. Any of these types of amps. I mean, I like martial amps. I'm surrounded by them. But that doesn't mean that they're only ones in the world. They're not. But I, personally, I think they're all uh, somewhat jeopardised, or will be in the future, by this or the technology, and it, it's not quite in the same league as the real thing. So once again, I want to thank uh, Fair Deal Music, uh, the boys at Fair Deal Music, uh, Gary, Gary, as they say in England, and uh, yeah, for letting me know, and uh, yeah, you'll find all the details below. Let's get on with the video and see what I saw. Oh, by the way, just before I do go, you'll find that in certain places the video's got, it's either a slightly bright or a bit dark or this or that or the other, because the fact is, I was walking around the factory and it went from very bright to very dark and that sort of thing. So just put up with that. It's not too bad, uh, but you should know that. Here's the video. Drum teacher. Um, that was in London, Hanwell. He um, opened up his own drum shop after the owner of the shop he was taking his students to told him to cut out the middleman as a joke and he said actually yeah and he built he started his own shop with his son Terry in Hanwell, London where he sold drums, drum equipment, music equipment, guitars, things like that. It wasn't until a few years later that he got involved with making amplifiers and that's where I can show you over here we have this over here in the display cabinet is Marshall's number one that's the first Marshall amp from 1962 So this would have been known as the JCM45, the Jim Terry Marshall. Um, this was the number one. There were a couple of other prototypes that we've got upstairs. I think there might be another one somewhere in the world. I'm not quite sure where. I think there is a third prototype as well. Um, next to it here, we've got the 8x12 cab. This was actually modified later on because it was too big, too heavy to move. This is why we've now got the two 4x12s, which we know as the Marshall stack you may have seen. So this is our 1974X, it's a reproduction of the original 1974 which was made between 1966 uh, and 68. 
if you look closely you can see all the intricate soldering parts components and where all the joints meet that's all done here in the factory just over there by our hand wires and if I could just point you over this way now to my team leader Alex she's going to show you around the electronics department to show you a bit about what we do here at Marshall Hello Hello Hello, Hello. Welcome, welcome to Electronics these two lines, what we have here, are our main production lines. This is where we produce all the JVM and studio range. Normally set up in four stages, and we also have a functional tester at the end that tests every single amp after But everything goes on here from the chassis to the panels, all individual PCBs, and any valves, and everything gets all, all put on here. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. Right, so what we have here is our hand loading area. What we do is we have boards, so our PCBs. They go through our auto insertion machines. And basically they will put in all of the smaller components into the PCBs ready to be hand loaded for the bigger parts, which is what Jody here is doing. So it should get bored just like this. AI puts in all the smaller components and then all the girls have got to do then is put in the bigger components by hand. Once they've done that, this helps in when it's going over the solder helps it all to stick in and seal and get good, good joints. Free heat temperature of this oven here is over 400 degrees. So it heats up very nicely, uh, makes all the components ready to basically get all sold. Then before it gets tested, before it goes over to the production line. So as you can hear, we've got a board coming up now. Solder pumps, pump tuck. And then the board just flows over. Once it's come down, like I said, we'll go down to our inspectors, they'll inspect it, test it before it goes off to go into the production line and we put into one of the others. We can make, depending on what we're building, anywhere in between 45 to maybe 80 boards a day. So we've got good eyes to really make sure that we're pushing them down. This here is a, a 1959 board, tag board, what we call them. They literally come in brown, nothing in. We put every single component in by hand. So all these rivets get riveted in here. And then I'll show you a board that's been hand loaded. And obviously once this is a board, JVM 410 power board. Once it's done, it's had all the valve bases put in. This is ready basically going straight into the lamp and get wired up. Yeah. So from the board that we had with all the rivets, once the girls have had, got their hands on it and they've inserted every single component, soldered every single component in by hand and um, put all the wires in by hand as well. This can take them anywhere from an hour and an hour and a half to actually bank and produce big guys. And then what will happen is the guys down there, these are doing all the hand wires. It takes them roughly, depending on the unit, anywhere from two and a half to four and a half hours. Depending on which unit they're making. But they will grab one of the chassis over here and they will build it from hand. So they will put, start off first wire to the last wire. Some people do have their preferences. I, I prefer to be like a, a 1987. I don't know why, because they are really, really fiddly. Because they're small and they've got a lot in. And you've got to get right in there sometimes. Some people don't like them, I do. Um, I think the mo the, what people do like to make are the 59s. So they, once all, they've all been hand wired and the guys have put all the valves in, they'll go straight into our test bay and our test bay test every single hand wire out. 
So that's the finished tag board that the guys have done. And then they've wired everything. And this is your 1959. Can get probably two out a day. Then we have two, four, eight people, roughly. And then uh, we just got our finished studio range. It's also been put through tests. So then, once any amp leaves here, it's ready to go into the pad and ready for finishing to finish off. So this here is the covering department. This is where they would take a blank wooden cab and this is where they'll put the leathers on, give it its colour, make it look like a Marshall. Um, before we get to that, we have the Jimi Hendrix signature stack. This was, I think, one of 600 units made. I'll just wait till this is the group. This is the Jimi Hendrix signature stack we have here. This is one of 600 units made. This is one that Jimmy would have used on his run. This isn't one that he would have used, but a replica of one that Jimi Hendrix, uh, Jimi Hendrix would have used himself. It's a take on the original JTM 45 with a few extra tweaks and additions made to it. Um, this was put out in 2006. We don't make them anymore. Um, anyone that can find one would probably have to be a, quite a rich man to afford it, I'd say. But yeah, any pictures you'd like to take, any questions, feel free. Otherwise I can take you up now to my colleague Paul who's going to show you what he does in covering. Right, hello everyone, welcome to covering. I shall start the tour with you. Do you like to follow me please? We have a conveyor system which works, goes through part of Woodmill. This is where the cabinets are loaded on. They then run through this oven here. This side is where we spray up the insides of the cabinets. The reason for running them through an oven is because the glue we use is a water-based or a heat-activated glue. So the, the cabinets this side are cooling down, but by the time they get round the other side ready for the glue, they're at the right temperature, the spray and for it to be dry enough for us to wrap it. If you'd like to follow me, I'll show you the other part. Just a little, uh, the only unit that's been ever, ever been made outside of this factory are these. These were made by Jaguar in 2002. They were obviously a limited edition. Jim gave some of them away, people, uh, I think Paul Weller had one. But the ones that were actually sold, all the money that was made from them went to charity. How's about that for an effects pedal? It's nine carat gold. Not gonna step on that. You wouldn't want to, you'd have to put your slippers on. Would you like to follow me? As you see, once the cadence's been wrapped, they're left on here, we have a system where we wrap all, we cover all the vintage first. Reason being is because that's when the glue and the cabinet are the warmest. And obviously with a vintage having no corners, you want them to stick. So the order is vintage, then the big cabs, then we work our way down to the heads if we've got any on the belt. Like to follow me? Obviously, the, that area there that's where we actually load, the other side. They come through, they get sprayed. This side is where they get the glue put on them. And they're sprayed in there. By the time they breach Jim Marshall's face, they're dry enough for the leather to be wrapped around it. Over this side is where the leathers and the backs are sprayed up. The guy spraying cabs and the guy spraying levers, the guy spraying levers would start just beforehand so that he stays in front of whoever's spray wrapping. The backs are sprayed here. They're left on a rack over there. We don't run them through the oven. 
that area there is quite warm because obviously you've got this oven here you've got that big wall the only thing what we do is when we spray up the leather for the backs we run them through this oven so you run the leather through put it on your bench come collect your backs put your back on it the heat from the leather reactivates the glue on the actual wood of the back so that gets rid of that problem this area here during the summer it's normally about 100 so if you want to lose a bit of weight this is the place to be um, we keep this going all afternoon um, making sure that the backs stay in a sort of like sync with all the cabinets we do because there's no point us making a cabinet without a back so I'll show you the different so, so if you've got a lamp that's been knocked around a bit you can bring it here and get it recovered oh god yeah yeah um, it all depends on how bad it is if well some of them get really bad yeah oh, oh trust me I've seen some really really bad ones I've actually yeah. recovered a cabinet that I first wrapped and covered so you get well, I've been here 36 years, and I've had it happen twice. Right. Um, but it's, it's a great buzz, because you're like, oh yeah, I've done that the first time, oh yeah. Or, or someone else has stripped it, should have put your name in it. Yeah. How's that happen? I said, well, you, when you've been here as long as I have, that's how you find out. So, this is covering. I came around with Phil Wells about 10 years oh, ago. Oh, yes. And he's retired. Yes, he, re he, he retired just before the pandemic. Yeah, now there is a guy there who oh he's he's phenomenal what doesn't he know yeah the guy uh, i've had some great times with him um he's so open yeah. and he knows so much he's so knowledgeable um yeah um there's a couple of uh, him doing tools on youtube yeah i did one. Oh, you did one but yeah it's he's sorely missed because he he used to work in service and you know there weren't a cabinet he couldn't repair so we can bring them in anytime oh yeah it, all you do phone up phone up service and they they can then tell you what time what's the best time to bring it in so and look, we've got here these are all the different levers we got right here's a quick one for you is that not an Indian restaurant wallpaper? Uh, every time I look at that, I think. And then that's one of my favourites. Oh yeah, I got one. The snake skin. Um, there's a, there's another one, the carbon fibre, uh, yeah. which we use on a lot of our MG stuff, and obviously we've got the frets to go with it. Um, that one there, that's one of the worst ones, because I, I can do fretting as well, and that's one of the worst ones. Because it's so thick, it's... Oh, that's thick. That's, yeah. So, when you, you've got a pair of grips, you're trying to pull it around. Problem is, because it's got that line on it, you've got to make sure that line stays straight, because if that line doesn't, you, it's not until it's actually in the unit, then you're looking and about three or four lines down you can see it dips because right. the line actually still doesn't go straight until a bit yeah. further down but this is one of my favorites this one here that's that's a hard one to do as well because oh, yeah. those lines are so close it's together like yeah but a lot of like some of our 74s and things like that we that's the threat we actually use on them yeah so yeah but if you get in contact with the design store they can help you out or service so right well that's what it takes to be in covering hope you've enjoyed it i shall uh, pass you on to chris chris All right okay so you're going to be entering the noisiest part of the wood factory now okay so if you want to wear earplugs, you can. Okay. Right. Thank you, Paul. Right. So, we're going into the wood mill. Um, you're going to come up with this machine here, which is the Morbidelli. So, all our wood come in 
ply form, 5x5 or 8x4 sheets. Out of those sheets, we will cut the panels for each piece that we're after, okay? After that process, we'll go to a machine which we call a hauncher, which will do the box joints, okay? What's that? Decent plywood. Decent plywood, yeah. Decent, yeah. We've had a lot of issues recently with pride trying to get a hold of it, but we're all good now. Right, if you can't hear, I do apologise, all right? So there we've got a, a whole cabinet in its wood form. Um, we used to do any offcuts or scrap we used to do use, we used to use it for batten work, MDF, chipboard when we were doing the AVT range. Now it's all made out of ply. So, as I was staying outside, this machine will cut from the panels wood into its own individual slot. So this is the most modern machine in the mill. So it will self-load, cut each panel, unload the other ends. That is the start of the process in the mill. Now, the old way we used to do it in the mill is by a panel saw, followed by the walk-ins. Now, that machine there is about 50 years old and we're still using it today. We are on the way on phasing it out because a lot of the parts are now obsolete. Hence why we're going to the CNC technology. The CNC will do exactly the same as what the Morby Deli will do but just more modern. So all what you see down here is what the Morbidelli can do and what the Watkins can do. That there is the overspill from the sanding area. So from those two processes out there, we come down to the RFC press. The easiest way to explain this, it is a giant microwave. That's all it is. So what we do, we use an adhesive and a hardener. We glue in between the joints. We put the sides on, tops and bottoms, we put them inside. Once we start the press up, it will clamp down, make sure everything is square and it will start cooking. This process will take about 30 seconds to cook. It will go from about 70 degrees to up to 130 degrees without burning anything. So once it's done that process, it'll, it'll end up like this. You cannot break that. Even if you drop it, it's not gonna do nothing. It's that hard. So from the press, it will come to the cab benches. So this is where we put all the batten work on. So we use softwood pine. We use a PVA glue and we pin it by using staples. Staples are there just to hold it in place. So we glue both ends. So when they start banging the rivets in and finishing, that will not move. If we don't glue it, then we'll get movement and that's when it's a bail. So, it will come down to the spindle once it's all done. So what the spindles do is put the profile on the unit. So we've got two different 
spindle radius is. We've got a 22 mil, which is for a standard unit, like a 960 base, angle unit, um, JVM series. A 15 mil rad is for the more hand wire old type units. SV, BXs, hand wire, that sort of thing. So, this little area here, we'll do all the backs and baffles for each unit. So it's the only little area within wood mill. It's got its own CNC machine there. I mean, Ben's got the logo machine there. I mean, when I first started, we used to drill all the logos by hand. Now we've got a house-built machine to do the Marshall logo. Press button and it's automatic, just like that. That's just a CNC logo. What? Over your, no, that's just a house-built machine. Over, over the back there is another machine, like the Morbidelli. Right. So, as well as in this area, you've got the hand router. A bit of history for you. This is Jim Marshall's first ever machine. Um, so, and it, we're still using it today. So, the last point of wood mill is the sanders. Everything you see outside and in here, hand built, hand sanded, here. We use a 40 grit paper, 80 grit paper and a 120 grit paper. The 80 and the 40 is for a standard 5 minute finish. The 80 and the 120 is for more for an old type finish. Because it's a thinner levant, we've got to make sure it's everything spot on, perfect. Any blemish, we've got to use a bit of wood filler to make sure any blemishes are gone. Once that's gone, it will come here to the holding area, ready for covering. So, if it's wrong, there's an issue from out there, we have to rework it. So we don't throw anything away. All this, we have to come, it'll come back, re-sand to the best we can. Then it'll go back out there and they can reuse it. So nothing is wasted. Any offcuts that we get from the Morbidelli, that goes to charities. Like the cir inner circle bit from, with baffles, so all, all the circle bit from there, they will go to a charity for the kids to use plaques and whatever. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. How are you doing, Jay? All right? Good. Any questions? No? Good. Done a good job then. Yeah. You've got me. Okay. Right. Welcome to finishing. You want to come this way, begin with. Right. When you first look at a unit, one of the main things you see is the baffle. Now, this is the baffle part of finishing. We get the baffles from the wood mill, painted, they come out to us, and then we put the fret on. Now, we do lots of different colour frets, as you can see and some of them are just done in plain white and then they have pictures printed on them. Now, we class them as design store. Uh, you can have virtually any picture you want put on them, but you've got to own the copyright. You can't have Coca-Cola on there or something like that without having permission from the owners of it to put it on. So, what we do is we fret the baffle in white we then have to mount it on a jig, which then gets sent off to a company called Icon, who are locally based, and they inkjet print the picture onto the baffle, which then gives you 
that sort of effect. These are ones that have had faults in them, so they've had to come off again and be redone. So we've got them, we've got different ones here. And we've got, on this baffle, shows all the different frets that we do and also the different logos that we do. Again, more examples of design store ones that have been done in the past. Now, you can see all the different colours of fret that we do that are along here. There was a couple more, but there's a couple that have been discontinued now. Uh, Andy's been here, what, 19 years now. We have about a four year break. He's not up to me, I'm up to 23. And the charge hand's up to nearly 35. So there's a lot of us that have been here for a long time, or been, gone, come back again. Yeah. But it looks easy putting the fret on, but it's not because you've got to put enough tension on it to get it straight, but also not rip it. And if you're not tight enough, there'll be bubbles down the front. Um, what do you reckon it's, the fret's made of? Any ideas? Any idea what the fret's made of? It's paper. It's like tissue paper. Uh, that's all it is. It's just like tissue paper and it's just all rolled and twisted up to do the fret. That's why it can be inkjet printed because it's paper. Obviously it's fire retardant protection and all this on it as well. Uh, yeah. uh, when Andy's finished fretting them up, we then go to the next bench just here, which is where we drill through the logo holes and then put the logos on. We just pushed on and then hit him with a hammer. So. Okay, we go around the corner, I'll show you some more bits. The backs come out from covering, they put them on trolleys for us. Um, different colours, different sizes, but they've got no holes in them. We then have metal jigs of varying sizes with holes in that we use to drill the holes out to match. We've got all sorts of different jigs for feet, backs, lots of different things. These are just racks where we store all our screws and bolts and all our plastics. We've got different types of corners. You've got a matte corner and you've got a gloss corner. Two different types. So, are those the same ones that go on? Yeah, ones yeah. Uh, well, combo. the gloss is the main one that goes on things, yeah. but some people specify they want the matte unit, matte. So, but they can go on with different colour rivets. We've got gold, silver, and black. So they go on like that. These are all the same unit. They're all the 1987. Now, that's how Coven get it from the wood mill. So they get it naked naked as such with nothing on it they put the covering on it and then it comes out to us we then have to put the bead in in the channel on this one and the piping around the edge which is all put on with staples so and um, the holes are pre-drilled in the back when the unit's made and then we just run a drill through so we can see the holes on the front push the logo in. Same with the metal grill there, held on with staples. So once we've done that and we've put the beading into the channels on the unit itself, we then can put the screening plate in, goes in there and it's ready to have the amp in. The handles go on, feet go on and everything else. Because these are design store ones, the standard unit will be black. This sheet tells us what colour lever to put on it. Then you've got what colour logo, there's lots of different logos, the piping, handle, 
and all the other bits. If it doesn't sell it on there, it's the standard unit. But that's why all these are different colours. Because each one of these is somebody's specifically ordered a different colour. So, and then the final unit oh, ends up with the amp being put inside and the bolts to hold it in place. These ones don't have corners on it. They're what are called old type. Where some of the others, like this one, have corners put on. So that's where you can choose what colour of it's if you want matte or gloss finish. Right. That's basically just our rack that we use for storing the stuff that comes from covering. They put it on there, and then we can put the corners and everything else on it. So if we come round a bit further, a few more different units, obviously different colours. Some have metal grills, some have plastic grills, all sorts of different things. This is what the piping is that we put round there. It's all held on with staples. We have to bend it to go around the corners and that's the beading that goes into the channel that's cut there again it's all held on with staples now putting these rivets in look is made look easy we make it look easy but it's not it takes about three months to get used to putting the rivets in most people when they first start they're like a woodpecker lots of little taps when you get used to people doing it it's two maybe three hits and it's in the more times you hit it the more chance you've got a damage in the rivet if you bend it put a dent in it or bend it you've got to take it out and put a new one in so you know it's an artwork art form to do you know and also not to hit your fingers too many times in the day same with putting the piping on. When you first start, it's really awkward to get it straight. Once you get used to it, you think, what took me so long to do? But about three months for people to learn the job, basically. There's 44 different units that we make in here alone. That's not including the design store. Obviously the design store, each one can be different colors and everything else. So. Stay on. Do you how long? How, do you, how does it stay in there? What, the baffle? The piping. The piping is stapled. It's all, st it's all staples that hold it on all the way around. Yeah. Same with the beading. When this gets put in, it's all held in with staples. This is this. It's this beading. It's the same. Try and do that. It's a to do. I can't do it. Ah. Practice. That's the thing, you get used to doing it and pushing it in. And obviously it's making sure covering cut the slot right so we can get it in nice and equally. Yeah, you've actually got vinyl underneath that or do you cut the vinyl right? No, the vinyl's cut. It's cut. It's cut, yeah. So yeah, they put a, yeah, they put a slot into it yeah. and then we can fit push it into it. Yeah, but you've got, to cut, you've got to make sure you cut it at the right sort of position. If you cut it on one side, you'll find it comes up this side or the other side. So they have to cut it in the middle. They use like a little bit they put onto their Stanley knife blade to hold it in the right place so they can cut it down the middle. If they don't, we have to take it back to them and get them to adjust it. So, but yeah, so it takes a long time for people to learn different jobs. All right, I think I'm going to have to pass you on because I think the next lot's ready to come around. Yeah. We've got queues, come, people coming from everywhere. Yeah, these are the speakers we're using, all the, all the cabs. Yeah, the selections. I'm trying to buy one, they're just out of stock everywhere. Yeah, well. <laughs> we've got loads of them. I can see where <laughs> So along here is where you'll see our units that have come from electronics. So they would have come straight from being tested for any defects both cosmetically and internally yeah. and they'll be passed on through these trolleys to these guys where they'll stick them in the cabs oh, nice. okay. and that's where <clears throat> that's what you've just learned about from finishing yes, yeah. from finishing they go on this conveyor belt and they'll go along there through those that door on the other side is a test room 
where there's just one guy and a guitar. Oh, wow. He's just testing the amps all day. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to walk down and have a look, there's got some 1960s on there in a minute. Celestion. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. yeah, it's been that way for as long as they've been around, yeah. All the amps that you see on the trolley there have come straight from electronics after being tested. Once they've passed that test, they go straight through on the conveyor to the warehouse where they're then boxed, packaged, and they're ready for distribution. Yep. So this is where this is where we this is the production line for the new re-release of the pedals here. So if you wanted to take any pictures or ask any questions, these are the first time they've been in production since I think the early 90s, 88 to the early 90s even produced, and now just last year we put it back into production. So here we've got Slash's signature collection. He is the only martial artist to have three signature amps with us, starting with the 2555 SL. This was made custom to replace his own amp, the 555X, that he was taking on road tours with him. It was old, damaged, beaten up, and he wanted something new to replace it. So he had this custom made. We made 3,000 of these units. And then after that, we had this one here made, the JCM slash here. This one, I believe, was named after the Guns N' Roses album, I think, Appetite for Destruction. There were 2,300 of these made. And then the third amp is the smaller. This one was sort of more of a, a home studio, bedroom sort of amp. This one's actually been signed by Slash himself, both the panel and the fret there. So yeah, along here on display, we've got a lot of the um, discontinued stuff. There's sort of the miniature JVMs that they used to do studio versions. We've got a special Black Label Society JCM 800 there. So here in the engineering block, you'll see where all the chassis are bent, welded and pressed here on the site. So I'm going to pass you over to the team leader of engineering, Phil. He's going to show you what he does here in the engineering block. OK, right. Well, good afternoon to you all. Uh, right, this is uh, our engineering department. So in here we uh, make all the chassis, rear grills, uh, pedals and any brackets that are required for the chassis. So we use mainly three different types of material. So we use um, uncoated steel, coated steel and aluminium. And we use the different uh, thicknesses depending on what the actual job is for. So smaller chassis use thinner material, larger chassis like the 410s, uh, big amps like that, which you've got bigger transformers in, use thicker material. So that machine there, the Vipros, what we do is we load on a two by one meter sheet of steel. Um, we set up all the tooling and then it will punch, it will stamp out all the holes like so. So this is a 25-25 chassis. Uh, so it stamps out all the holes, puts like the earth marks in, um, cable tie um, marks as well. Once um, they've been punched on the machine, then we then take them off, we shake them out of the sheet. Uh, they are then, uh, all the edges are filed and deburred so there's no sharp edges on them. Uh, once they've been finished and they're in a flat form like that, they're then taken over to the brake press where James over there is uh, folding them into shape. So you take that and then you fold it into the required shape like that. Once they've been all bent up into shape, we then press fit in all the spacers, the nylon nuts, uh, earth screws, any other nuts or anything else that's required. Uh, this, is, um, this chassis goes out and gets powder coated at a local company. And some of the chassis don't get powder coated and they're ready. So once they're finished, they're then ready to go to electronics and be assembled. Uh, this is a vintage chassis. All our old vintage chassis like 1987s, 2245s, 1962s, 959s, uh, 4100s and 2203s are still made like they were originally where all the ends are still hand welded and then they go out and then they get uh, to a local company and they get nickel plated and they come back like that. Uh, we also make all the rear grills that are required so we have to punch in all these holes uh, these also go out and get powder coated at a local company um, and we're now making the reissue of the pedals as well here 
Um, so these are punched on the machine and then they're bent on there. Obviously it's quite a design to be um, bent. They're quite fiddly to do. Uh, so, and they're punching or stamping the Marshall logo. These then get powder coated and then screen printed on. Then they come back and then they go to electronics where they're assembled into fully working pedals. Uh, that is a Dave Mustang uh, signature amp. Uh, as you can see, it's signed on the top. Um, so we had the base, and there was a, an angle what, that went on the top, and then the head would go on the top of that. Um, the grills on those are actually metal. They were stamped here on that machine, because uh, we've got a special diamond-shaped cutter um, tool that punches out all the holes. Then they were powder-coated, and then they were ready to go on. The reason he had that metal grill just for himself is because a lot of people at his show were throwing things on stage, and it would damage, oh, well, it would damage the fret. So he asked for a metal grill so that anything people threw it in, it would right off. That's a good idea. Yeah. I didn't know that, but that's a good idea. I just know how to make them. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what we do in engineering. Does anybody have any questions or would anybody like to know? Uh, the, the chassis that are uncoated are coated in a Zintec. So they've already coated so they don't go rusty. Okay? Uh, mild steel is what we use for, say, this chassis or the vintage chassis. Because they're going out to be plated, they don't need um, coating on them because they're getting plated anyway. Um, the rear grills, they're also mild steel, but because they're getting painted, they don't need to be either. So anything that's not getting painted is on a coated material that doesn't go rusty. Okay. Do you do all the printing and stuff in there? Well? No, no. All the, all the printing or screen printing is done uh, outside a, a third party. So we make them, we stamp them all, and then as I said, they get sent out to be powder coated and then screen printed. As well as manufacturing and designing our world-class amplifiers, we also own drum company Natal. So we actually design and manufacture drums as well. Just wait for the rest of the tour. <laughs> so down here on the right is the Natal drum cage. This is where we keep all of the custom designed Natal drums, anything ordered by artists, bands, martial artists, or just general custom. They're all in here. You'll see on the side here, we've got some ready to go out to the bands. As you can see. So if you get a good look inside the cage, you can see all the different models. You can come around this way. You can see all the custom models, all of the different designs that we can do all the different prints and finishes that we can provide for customers. So as I was just saying, as well as amplifiers, we also own the Toll Drum Company, so we also design and manufacture drums, drum kits, accessories, things like that. So these ones here will be ones going out for our martial artists most likely. Inside we can see all of our custom drum kits, all the different finishes that we can do. We say the last time I heard of an artist coming to pick up an um, a drum kit. About three years ago, Rick Astley came by and picked up his own kit that he takes on tour with him. Yeah. So this is just a martial warehouse. So everything that you've seen made in the factory will end up in here. Everything from the Vietnamese factory as well, like the MGs you see up there, the codes, DSLs, these are all from the Vietnamese factory. Right. So for the 60th anniversary of Marshall, they teamed up with David Brown and Mini to create the Marshall Mini for the 60th anniversary. That's kitted out with a DSL and a portable Bluetooth speaker in the back there as well. Inside is leather to replicate the look of our amps with the black and gold leathers. And if you take a closer look, you can see on the pedals, we've got skip, pause and play for the clutch, acceleration and brake, which I think was a nice touch. So if you come around this side as well, you can see the black rocker cover for the engine with the 60 years of loud print on the top there as well. Again, we've got the David Brown on there as well. Really nice touch. This is one of 60. I'm not sure where the other 59 are. Yeah. What can you say? So they are out there somewhere, but we've got this one. And then just behind us here, we've got the B&W bike. Now, 
The reason this is here is because they partnered up with us to Thanks create so their much. sound system and their speakers. So all the speakers in this are provided by Marshall. Oops. So yeah, when you, you, you do hear them coming, it's not just the engine. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, we've got the Marshall cow. This was just a little piece made to celebrate 50 years of Milton Keynes. So if anyone wants to get any pictures. <laughs> so yeah. So whenever you're all ready, I can take you through to the studio. You realise you have the back bits as well. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got the Marshall logo on the side here as well. So welcome to the Marshall studio. This used to be the Marshall Theatre where Jim would bring his family, friends, relatives, or anyone who wanted to try out the amps. We also held gigs here and events, but it's been converted into a world-class studio. So I'm going to pass you over now to the head of the studio, Adam. Cool. Come on in, gang. Right, so my name's Adam. I'm the studio manager here. I look after this building. I'm also the head engineer, um, and I produce and mix albums. He's also in charge of the sheep dip in the summer. Yeah, the sheep dip, the lab dip, all those dips. Um, the dip dab. Yeah. And I produce for the Which everyone label. thought were dip dabs for years, but it's actually dip dabs. Yeah, not. I don't no, know. it's not all these years. I'm not misreading the label because right. you're too keen Wait. to get to the sherbet. You right. know what I mean? I'm right there. You'll thank me one day. Behind you is Harris. He's the PR for the record label. So, Hello. any record label related questions, he's your man. Mm. Um, I think what a lot of people think is they come into this space, they go, oh yeah, Marshall built a studio, whatever. They walk in here and go, oh god, no, Marshall did build a studio. So what we've got here is kind of a US style studio in the UK. Loads of space, our live room is a 250 cap venue, a space for bands to be set up and play together as live, space for, to have as many different setups as you want, drums, bass, guitars, forever. It's a cake. really cool, cake forever, fully cake. licensed bar. So I'd mention cake again, just keep the, keep the thread rolling there, really. You know what I mean. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the you. studio <laughs> yeah. is this wonderful recording console. And it was built for us by a world expert, the guy that looks after the equipment for Kate Bush, for Metallica, for Benny from ABBA. He's also this guy here. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I, I'm quiet and sit at the back, not getting anyone's way, obviously, as you can tell. So Blake will now tell you about his creation. Yeah, I uh, found the remains of this desk. I'd heard about it for many years. And I found the frame in a warehouse in Burbank, covered in cardboard boxes. And I tracked it down. It took about another three years to get out of LA. And um, I knew I'd got all the bits to rebuild it because most of the parts were missing. But I'd already got those parts already. So we put them together to make modules and put all the parts back in modules that had bits missing. I took the patch bay off the end and put it in the middle. So you've now got a place to sit and look at your screen without screwing your head around. Because everyone used to mix like that, looking at the screen. Or they'd sit at the screen and listen to the speakers like that. And osteopaths made a fortune twisting everyone's heads back around because they didn't make it different. You know, they just stayed like that for a week. So I got fed up with that. I made it like this. It's the only out of it in the world like this. And now it's two smaller desks mixed together. It sounds much faster and harder and cleaner than it did. And I chose the modules to be 1093s because they have the sound, they're the same type of module that EMI chose and had made for me, for the EMI studios. So there were so many EMI Neve desks in the world, uh, a few, rarity. Um, so this has that sound, loads of other filters that the desk don't have that I've actually made it do. So it does lots and lots of little tricks. But above all, it's quiet and has the ability to just let drums just come through. Drums sound like a drum kit, really fast and hard, you know? So you can mess about with them later on. It gives the compressors and everything something to do. And you can knock the corners off with other bits of vintage gear to make it all these different flavours. Whereas if you just record stuff on average gear and you've got a very average lacklustre sound, what are you going to do with it? Speed it up, can't be done. You can't put something back that was never there in the first place. So, you know, it's like on a cheap television with a bad signal. You can play with the sharp and image but it's still not as good as just the correct information and the correct image in the first place you're fooling yourself so when you and course that would work as a concept just running one channel but when it all adds up 
and you start mixing everything together, you suddenly realise what you're dealing with, and a whole drum kit from set up in there sounds phenomenal. Right from day one, the first session you did, um, if, well, here will probably work, these mics will probably work, let's try that. Came in here and faded it up, like, holy crap, sounded amazing. I've been using Pro Tools professionally since I was 18, I'm 32 now. Very old. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, you'll you, be mate. fine. Cheers. That's all right. Um, I don't so know don't, how to don't use don't get a room. So it's never, all right. We just... So it is what it is. Um, but Ollie over here, the studio assistant, he's actually far more talented than I am, better looking. He understands logic. So if any logic stuff we need to do, we just take that upstairs to Ollie's room. Um, Not his bedroom, it's just another room. <laughs> no, it actually is his bedroom. Well, we haven't told him. Yeah, that, he, he yeah, lives there, so he actually well. does live there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean. That's why he only eats pizza, omelette, toast, biscuits. Because it's the only food we can get under the door. But yes, uh, Focus right are my favourite interfaces. Yeah. The great thing about these, you don't know they're there. It just lets the, the console speak to itself. Yeah. Just records transparent. But what's cool about in. these is they're on Dante, which is the audio over IP thing. And we've got a 5G connection on the roof. And there's 5G at the stadium and 5G at the pole. So my chemical Romans played the stadium last summer. We recorded them in here over 5G. And we'll do the same when Muse play the pole. Record them in wow. 5G over here. So, Put my Marshall hat back on, a bit like our amps, it's the best of modern and vintage. Yeah. They are, see, I'll slip that in nicely. <laughs> but yeah, we've, we're, we're fully booked now basically almost till the end of the summer. Um, and you know, the recordings we do here are incredible and they come out really well. So it's one of those things where this, in its previous life, did the Rolling Stones, did, did Lizzie, did Wham. The first record we here, did here was the Nova Twins record that was Brit Award nominated, uh, Merck Prize nominated, one crying album of the year. So it's all cool. And more cake. And more cake, so it's all a mixture of old and correct new, and getting that combination in the corner of that table there. There's my MacBook Air and my Nokia 5110 next to it. See what I mean? There you go. That's the story of how that's there. You go. So, this is your only chance you in the world to ask you a question. You? I can drop that on the phone and it doesn't break it. Everyone just goes, Wow. And if not, go have some cake, hang out in the live room, Ollie will take you out there. And um, it's a really nice space. Yeah. Really nice space. It's great. I'm pleased with this room came out. Okay. Right, well, welcome to the uh, live room of, of the studio. So, as you can see here, we've got a wide range of Marshall Amp, no shortage. Um, we spare no expense here, as you can see. Um, there's opportunities to get your photo taken in front of the stacks with, uh, with Terry Marshall himself, just there. Um, and as you can see around the other room, we've got a few rigs you can uh, plug and play. Uh, just feel free to touch anything, take photos of anything. Another standout thing we have is George Michael's actual piano from his house. Very significant, very lovely piano. It's an 1890s Bechstein, so it's got some history. And uh, it even has authentic George Michael stains on them. Take that as you will. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's, it's a lovely big space. Uh, when we do all the recordings here for the label, for the YouTube channels, both Natal and Marshall, yeah, if you ever watch any of those videos, you'll definitely recognise the background. The stuff. Yeah, it was, well, here, wasn't it? it was on that yeah, stage. Exactly. So uh, obviously the room's been redone and reinsulated yeah, yeah, yeah. since then, but it has been changed. It has, yeah. I came but around here ten years ago, and that, none of that was. Yeah, no, it's it's been it's been a big refurb, really. But but yeah, so this is the this is the space, and like I said before, everything that's ever come out of Marshall Records was recorded in this room pretty much so it's it's great and it's also a 250 cap venue so we do tend to do certain gigs sometimes um, it's 250 cap including staff so the sort of size gigs we tend to do are album release parties and things like that so it's not super commercial it's also quite difficult to turn this room into somewhere safe for a but gig. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. But for little performances, you know, we're me and Adam definitely enjoy putting on those gigs, so yeah. Thanks very much for you're very you're very welcome.